I am very happy to be back in Rochester and to meet uh, several old friends and some new ones. It's always a privilege to come to this city, which is which has got some special vibrations and uh, is right in the heart of the area, which appears to be undergoing that kind of ferment, spiritual ferment, where things are going to happen. Looks like the transition of spirituality from the east to the west is not merely a vague, cloudy transition taking place just over the globe. It looks like there are specific areas where that particular movement is coming up. It happened in the past in Asia. There were certain periods when China produced a lot of mystics, a lot of uh, wise, enlightened people who gave insight into the nature of human consciousness, into the nature of creation, into the nature of how human beings perceive creation and how they determine that there has to be a creator and how then they try to establish a relationship and a contact with the creator. There were periods in India when a number of saints, mystics, masters came and gave the same message. There were periods in the Middle East when a number of masters came and gave the same message. There were periods in the Muslim world, in the Islamic world, where peers and murshids came and gave the same message. So at different times, different parts of the globe, of this planet, have had that experience of uh, people coming up who have strange abilities. Not only have the ability to know what's going on and to realize it firsthand, but have also the ability to share that with us, with ordinary people, so that we ordinary people who would not otherwise be able to have this information and knowledge are able to gather that information and knowledge and make use of it. Relying upon information I received from the great master way back, 40, 45 years ago, I am making some statements here. And those statements relate to these changes taking place in the progress of spirituality itself, of evolution of human awareness, which is bringing this part of the planet into special prominence. In fact, I have privately confessed to many of you earlier that the reason why I came hurriedly to this country was to get a ringside seat as quickly as I could before the action starts. But this area where we are now is obviously close to the epicenter of the new drama that will unfurl. So I am very happy to be here amongst fellow travelers on the spiritual path. Today, you have asked me to speak on a slightly different kind of subject, a bird's eye view of the progress of, of humanity on this planet, or perhaps planet was not mentioned. But this particular subject deviates from the kind of subjects that are picked up. I have a suspicion that the reason why this subject was picked up, as you know, I don't pick up my subjects. They're always handed over to me to speak on. But the reason was that in the past few meetings, I have been saying that it doesn't really matter what subject you pick up, I say the same thing. And they said, this time, let's trust him out and give him something totally different. That I realize that what you have asked me to do today is a formidable task. The only advantage I have is that I got a chance to listen to the great master in India 40 or 45 years ago on precisely this very subject. So I can almost like a parrot repeat what I heard. And it is it has got such startling information that I was too startled to share with other people earlier. But since you have now brought that as a subject, I have to share that with you for whatever it is worth and leave it to your judgment how far that appeals to you. One of the most startling things that were mentioned by the great master was that human beings have not evolved from animals. That Darwin made an error. That Darwin's chronology of the evolution of the species which brings the human being on the scene 
only a quarter million years ago is not correct. That human beings in different forms have existed on the planet right from the beginning. Their forms have changed. They might have looked like monkeys, but they were not monkeys. They might have looked like other two-legged reptiles, but they were not reptiles. They might have looked like other beings, but they were not other beings. They were human. And what distinguished them from other beings was not the form, not the bodily structure, but their ability to discriminate, their ability to reason, their ability to exercise free will, their ability to choose. And this stayed with them whatever form they took. It was a strange statement at that time when Darwin held the field. And it was assumed that there was no human being at all on this planet Earth a quarter of a million years ago. Till a scientist came and broke fresh ground. And his name was Professor Leakey, who did work in South African mines. And from there was able to find out that there was a homo sapiens, a man, a man like us, who existed upon this earth in Africa five million years ago. In three years, he went on to discover that there was a man on this earth ten million years ago. He died, but his junior Leakey kept on the research along with another team. I was so fascinated by this news that I ran to find out where are they holding these records. Because the, for the first time, a scientific group was telling me that what the great master said was right and what Darwin said was not right. And I was told that the best collection of the Leakey family's research was lying in Washington, D.C. in the National Geographic Society's offices. They had a special museum set up in the 60s to show the work that the Leakeys were doing. So I went up there and saw all the evidence they had collected and I found that they were confining themselves to Africa not because man existed in Africa but because the kind of evidence they found in the coal mines, the mines existed in Africa. That had there been similar evidence elsewhere, you would have found men elsewhere too. Therefore, there was no real evidence that the original man came only from Africa. It was only that we found some evidence there. Work has gone on. Only a few months ago, I have again visited the National Geographic Society and found they have now evidence of man on this earth 25 million years ago. Totally throwing out the Darwinian theory of the evolution of species bringing man on earth at this time. The missing link is not a missing link, it is missing. There is a difference between the animals and the human being. And that difference is not merely in biological bodily structure. So if you want to study the story of man's advent on this planet, you may have to listen to some other kind of evidence which is not available to the scientists yet. Because picking up these impressions from coal mines, these fossils, they are very limited. You don't have too much data. So much tumult has taken place. The continents have moved away. There has been such a big shift upon the earth. The continents have shifted. The poles, magnetic poles have shifted. Look at the changes that have taken place upon this planet. What evidence are we looking for? If this is not enough, then we have to now look at the new work astronomers are doing. And the astronomers are coming to strange conclusions because they were also trying to look into the past. They did not know in the beginning they were looking into the past. They thought they were looking out into space. They wanted to look out into the stars. That was their subject. Astronomy meant the study of the stars, the stellar study. And when they put their telescopes to look at the stars, after finding out that there were the blinking stars, the twinkling stars, and there were the non-twinkling stars, and finding out that the non-twinkling stars were not stars, they were planets of our single solar system, and we had only access to one star, which was our sun, they began to look at the twinkling. The twinkling was taking place because of the vast distance. The nearest star next to the sun, which they could locate and have been able to locate till today, is so far away 
that light traveling at 186,000 miles per second takes a year to come here, one year. You can imagine how far that place is. And that's the nearest star they could find. When they looked at the star, they did not want to write all these long digits. There were no computers at that time. And they did not have the exponential way of determining the distance. So they used the more simple way of describing it in terms of the time taken by light to travel the distance to show how far it was. And thereby lay the rub. Because when they said that star is one light year away, they unwittingly, unknowingly acknowledged that the star they were looking at is there one year ago and not today. Because if the star is there today, they can't see it. It will take one year for the light of the star to come here before you can see it. Therefore, they were seeing a star up in the sky which was one year old. And then they began to develop better telescopes. Meanwhile, new theories had come up, new explanations had come up, including the Einstein's famous theory of relativity, general theory of relativity, which explained that light travels at a uniform rate irrespective of anything else. Well, everybody assumed that light must travel at a uniform rate. But they found that light need not travel at a uniform rate. If it is a wave motion, which they presume that light must be a wave motion of electromagnetic waves in ether, which is the medium they are supposed to exist in space in order to have a wave motion, it did not follow the laws of particles, it did not fully follow the laws of waves, waves appeared to be more acceptable, so they assumed there was a medium called ether filling the whole of space and that the waves of light that move to us must be at a certain speed which they could measure. As science grew, technology grew, we could measure the speed of light, the velocity of light. But then we could also measure the velocity of other wave mo motions such as sound. When we have a sound, it moves in the, in the medium of air. And when it moves, the, when the sound waves come to us, if the source of sound is coming towards us, the waves get compressed. And the pitch of the wave becomes different. If the source of sound is moving away, then the wave gets elongated because the source is pulling the wave away. And therefore, the wave, wave length becomes larger and the pitch becomes different. This can be seen when a railroad train and its engine comes blowing a whistle. As it comes towards us, the pitch changes differently as it recedes away from us, the pitch changes in a different direction. This simple fact was discovered by Mr. Doppler, the scientist, and is today known as the Doppler effect. The Doppler effect shows that the wave motion changes according to the velocity of the body emitting those waves. All these planets and stars reflecting the light or originating their light are moving. When studies were made about the movement of stars and the movement of planets, it was found irrespective of whether the source of light was coming towards us or going away from us, the velocity of light remained the same. This was a strange, one of the strangest discoveries in science till today, that the pitch and frequency of that wave motion of light should remain constant, irrespective of the movement of the source, thereby showing that source is not that real as the wave motion itself. Thereby, Einstein propounded one of the greatest theories, saying that this alone is real, that light and its velocity alone are real, that everything else is relative to that, including so-called movement. He further found out that even so-called time was relevant, was relative to that, and time became merely an ordinate of the space-time continuum and no longer the kind of time we always assume and still live in today. So these were great discoveries which threw a new light upon the possibility of understanding nature of time, when things are happening, what do we mean by distance and when we, after this discovery, began to look at the stars. We knew that the distance in terms of light waves does not represent any particular movement or velocity of stars, it represents the distance in time of the stars. 
and we began to discover stars 2 light years away, 10 light years away, 100 light years away, million light years away. Now we have found the nebula, the substance that makes stars, which are billions of light years away. And we've drawn pictures of those. Some of those pictures are even available in the planetarium in Chicago and in Boston. Those latest pictures of the nebula, which were created billions of years ago in this planetary system, from which the galaxies came, from which the solar systems came, from which the planets came, from which the earth came. We can have seen them on pictures and see them on movies. It's a great development to be able to see the history of our own planet. When this had been secured, all this information had been secured, it was found that life, including human life, can come into being by a process not yet understood, where the carbon molecules forming organic matter can develop a living cell within themselves, which living cell is the source of all development. And each living cell has a total genetic code of the entire living creation of this planet. This again, in terms of biology, is a very big discovery. People did not know how these cells multiply. How does it happen? If we get a little scratch here on the skin, if I am walking and I get a little scratched here, my skin is torn a little bit and I go and I put a band-aid or I don't put a band-aid and I notice that gradually the skin is healing, which means the cells that were erased taken off, are building afresh. The old cells are multiplying, one becoming two, two becoming four, and they keep on building like this till that rupture is healed and the cells stop growing. Who tells them stop? There must be somebody telling them stop, somebody telling them go. Who is giving the traffic light to them? Now go, now stop. Because when each cell is taken separately and examined scientifically, it is found to contain only one function. The cell has only one function and the function is multiply. If you are one, become two. If you are two, become four. That is the only function of every cell. But that the cells can transform from one to the other and stop growing when it is no longer needed according to the pattern of the body. This was hidden for a long time in a small chem chemical language written in the center nucleus of the cell called the genetic code and it has been decoded only very recently. Today I can share this with you because all this scientific knowledge has become common knowledge and people know that the genetic code contains all the information required to tell the cell, look at your neighbor and then multiply. Now we have been able to distinguish between different kind of cells in the human body. There are two new books that have just come in. They lie on my table in Chicago. If some of you get a chance to see them, you'll be surprised to see how much we know about the human body now. One is called The Incredible Machine, published by uh, Time Life magazine. The other is called The ABC of the Human Body, published by Reader's Digest recently. Now, you see that the latest information and photographs of cells have been produced. And the cell, which is so small, it has been shown how the cell is composed of 46 chromosomes put together, how this nucleus has a division of windows and doors which remain shut, somebody remains hidden inside, that only two windows or four windows open and the remaining 60 windows are closed, that if more windows are open, the cells are prominent, have their own ego, they order other, other cells around. That if in this human body, we have a two window cell, that cell is just looking on either side what to do and does exactly what the neighbor does. It has no other power, no other genetic code open to it. The genetic code is closed. Except this part, look at your neighbor and do what the neighbor is doing. There are other cells which instruct, no, this is the code, now you don't do it or you do it. The four window cells. There are other eight window and sixteen window cells which give access to the whole pattern. Now, don't become a bone. We already done enough of bone. Become blood. And they change from one structure to another structure. From one form to another form. The code of every type of tissue is available fully, 100% in every gene. Which means every cell has a complete data on every kind of tissue that can be created. Not only that, 
it has exactly the pattern of the human form in which it is operating. Now, I have, I have known Jack Bemmel for so long, and I know that all the cells of his face, they change every few months, because cell life of the skin is very small. The new cells come, the old go away. The other cells stay longer. The bone cells stay longest, 7 years to 12 years. Did you know 12 years is the maximum life of any cell in the human body? That means after 12 years, you can be absolutely sure it's a totally new body that you've got. And yet you look the same. I recognize Jack Bemmel, he looks just the same. How can the cells know what face he has, what appearance he has, what kind of smile he has, what kind of vocal cords he has, how he has that lovely voice? How do the cells know all that? When this study was made in their two Nobel laureates who have worked hard on this, they have given us the information that the cells not only contain the data about the functioning of other cells, they have a total data about your whole structure, how you should look, how you should feel, how your brain should function, that they have a total genetic code. And since they pick up the genetic code through inheritance, through the genes that come from the family, they have a total knowledge of the parents, grandparents, great-grandparents right up to Adam and Eve. And not only that, they also can go back to Adam and Eve and through that to any other branch and therefore each cell of every tissue in every body has a genetic code of every human being who has ever lived in the past or will live in the future. This is not a spiritual statement of a, of a mystic or saint. The statements of genetic engineers and scientists on the gene. Otherwise, it cannot function as it is functioning. There is no other explanation. Can you imagine? A cell that is so microscopic, it is so small, contains the complete computerized directions for construction of any human being ever in the past, present or future. What kind of genetic code is that? And this genetic code we have inherited and is coming all the way down. And each one carries the genetic code of everyone else. If Darwin is correct that we have evolved from the other species, then it would also follow that every cell has not only the genetic code of every human of human beings, but of all other species too. Which means every living cell on this planet Earth is containing a small diagram of the entire universe. And through its mechanism of control, of supervisors, supervisors, and there is just one cell who might have 32 or maybe all 64 windows open somewhere in the brain. One single cell who gives the directions for the whole operation to take place. They are now started calling it the master cell. Nice word to choose. That there is a master cell that must give directions to all of the cells to grow as they are growing. But the point I am making is that we are carrying with us the entire history of this entire race, of this entire universe, of every living thing. And not not only a few samples of it, in abundance, because we have got billions of cells, each one of us are carrying billions of cells. Each one of us are capable in a catastrophe, in a crisis, if this earth is destroyed, a little part of us, a little skin of us could fly out into outer space and be preserved and used by more advanced scientists somewhere else, they could recreate the whole of the human population again. It's quite possible, that's how we came here, and the whole earth got populated. We do not know. We cannot find coal mines to get the answer to these questions. But we can study another aspect of biological sciences, and that is the aspect of environment. The environment which can sustain a certain type of living matter and living being. A certain temperature is required to maintain the human body. In ideal conditions, it should be 94, 96 degrees in the blood and 68 degrees in the air outside. Ideal. Who recorded this idea? Well, the first time it was recorded by the Egyptians. And they did a great job. They recorded in such a way that they said humankind in future should also be able to find out. They built the great pyramids. And in one of the pyramids, the big pyramid, they built a strange kind of staircase and a tunnel. And they organized that the tunnel should be so placed 
the stones should get the heat of the sun and the cold of the earth in such a way that the temperature in the tunnel should remain 68 degrees Fahrenheit 24 hours all the months of the year continuously. It is still 68 degrees today. Any one of you can go and visit that pyramid of the pharaohs and see the temperature is 68 degrees. It corroborated what they wrote even thousands of years earlier in their texts that the ideal temperature for the human body to thrive in, to grow in, to evolve in, to think in, to be conscious in is 68 degrees. And they created a no air conditioning. They didn't use any air conditioning. They used the natural ability of earth changing its temperature during day and night and the sun heating stones during the day and night and putting them together in such a pattern at such a place inside the pyramid that the temperature could be maintained at 68 degrees. It took a long time for, for, the, uh, for the weather people, the meteorologists to examine the surface of the earth using satellites and recently they came up measuring inch by inch of this earth's surface and they said some places are so cold like Rochester in winter, so many degrees below, below zero and some places are so hot, 120, 125 degrees in the Sahara Desert. That this is a strange combination of temperatures upon this earth, such hot and cold temperatures. So they took inch by inch, square inch by square inch and asked the com computer, why don't you tell us what is the average temperature on the surface of the earth? And the computer worked out square inch by square inch and came to a round figure and said the average temperature on the surface of the earth is 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Surely those Egyptians were no fools. But they didn't have the satellites. They must have something else. When you come and come across these strange things that have happened in the history of mankind, you find that the awareness of man, the consciousness of man was not dependent upon the limited sources of knowledge that we have ascribed to knowledge from time to time. That there is much greater potential for knowing, for knowledge in the human being. And what they found out was, the envir environmental experts, they found out was that if these conditions are created, this kind of temperature, this kind of composition of air, nitrogen and oxygen and the availability of carbon in organic form, if you put all these things together in another planet, just have the same environment, there is no reason why human beings cannot be there without transferring for you. But they do not know how it is transferred because life is not fully understood. What brings life into a cell is still under study. It may take another 20 years, 200 years, we don't know. Scientists may come up with more acceptable explanations of what is life. Till then, they have come to the conclusion that given this kind of condition upon a planet, human beings can come. Having said that, it corroborates the great master's statements that I am sharing with you, that when the conditions upon this planet became like what they are, the human being stepped upon it. Although it was a very bizarre kind of situation, there were no buildings and homes like this, and this kind of scientific technology and creature comforts took place later. The rest of the paraphernalia of human consciousness, the ability to choose, to think of environment, should I go this way or that way, that continued to grow. In that process, many experiences were obtained. The other day, I went with a few friends to the Epcot Center. Epcot Center is supposed to be a center set up next to Walt Disney World Magic Kingdom in Orlando to study what tomorrow is going to be like. So therefore, it is a futuristic look upon man's progress. How has man progressed? They are trying to take a look into the future. And they want to show the past, to show how we have come along. In one of the exhibits there, they trace the history of man from the days of the dinosaurs. Why do they take the history from the dinosaurs? That's all they know. That's all the bones they could find. It's the same story. Just like we couldn't find more coal mines, we can't find any other bones, so dinosaur must be the earliest. But fortunately enough, when they picked up the bones of the dinosaurs and reconstructed models of the dinosaurs, and there they made, like Mickey Mouse style, a dinosaur who can move his head and walk about 
in the same exhibit where you are riding a trolley, when they made those exhibits, they tried to be as exact as possible to what they thought was happening millions of years ago on this earth. And they tried to show how the plants had come up already and the dinosaurs were vegetarian for their information, Dr. Benson, Dr. Harris Benson, that how they're eating grass, they don't eat other beings. And uh, the fact they died away may not be because of the diet. But when you look at them, I was able to show to some of my friends based upon the information, which I must say was derived from the great master, not some study of too much literature. I was able to show even in that mock-up setup, those beings standing there who I said, there's the human being of the time. Any one of you can go and see. See the head, the brain of a two-legged creature standing in that exhibit and that is the human being of the time. And that human being was, in terms of consciousness, performing that function which human beings have always performed till now and will continue to perform so, since so long as they last on this planet, which is the function of free will. All other functions are common, forget them. To breed, to eat, drink, sleep, all those are common functions. Everybody, every living thing is doing that. All the animals are doing it, birds are doing it, everybody is doing it. This is one thing only human beings are doing. To make a choice. To be able to choose, should I do this or that? And to bring this choice up into an experience in consciousness. Not only a mechanical choice made by a computer, but a deliberate, but a deliberate choice. A choice which becomes a conscious experience. This distinguishes a human being of everybody, everybody else and everything else. And that choice making has gone on for so long. The Upanishads deriving their knowledge from the Vedas in the thousands of years ago, recorded thousands of years ago, they say that but for this choice of a human being, this world would come to an end. Why? Why is the choice making of human beings so important for the survival of the world? The reason is, it is by choice making that so-called destiny comes into operation. We say everything is happening by destiny. Why are people, some rich, some poor, some sick, some healthy, some dying young, some living old, some living in good big buildings, some just roaming on the streets? Why is that happening? Why there is so much discrimination? Why are there so many differences? Even amongst the equal children of the creator of God. If he created all of us as his children, why did he discriminate so much? We are fighting against discrimination on this planet. Why don't we ask him? And his answer is, I never discriminated. Your free will did it. But when we look back, how can our free will discriminate so much? We go to another important law laid down and enunciated and explained thousands of years ago in the original Rig Veda, the law of karma, the law that says we make our own destiny depending upon what decisions we take through free will. It's a big law. It says that human beings when they are trapped in the physical experience of a planet, they keep on moving. And not only do they move through the genes, through the genetic code, from one body to another, carrying the material frame with them, they move in terms of consciousness, which also goes and picks up the same bodies. It may deviate a little bit here. It's a continuous movement going on. Imagine a number of cells of consciousness, invisible carrying all the memories, carrying all the attitudes. They are moving around and then they go locked up in a body. And the body functions in a certain way according to a certain destiny. And the body lives for a short while, 50, 60, 100 years and disappears, disintegrates. And those conscious cells carrying all that memory, not only of the past, but also of another experience of the body, then float around and then they again look for another body. Meanwhile, those cells in the genetic system operating again set up another body carrying the same thing again. And, the, and those floating consciousness cells go and pick up that body again. And so it goes on and on in terms of millions of these structures moving in a stream of history. Can you imagine that? What would it mean? A person asked me, I heard, a person told me, I have heard that your great master once said, 
that if there is a good seeker of God, a sincere seeker of God, he not only seeks and finds for himself, he benefits even his own progeny. He benefits his children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, right up to the seventh level. He said, does the great master mean that this benefit has only to pass on to future generations? Couldn't a father, grandfather, great-grandfather also take advantage of this? A particular good seeker has come up. He has done some good work. Even if he makes a lot of money, some of the relatives make use of it. And he is getting much better wealth. Don't his ancestors get any advantage? I said, let me put it to great master and find out. So I went to great master. I said, a friend of mine in college wants to know if the benefit goes to the ancestors also or only to the future progeny. And he laughed and he said, what's the difference? They are the same people. Don't you see how they move? Don't you see the same people keep on moving almost in the same families over and over again? And I said, why should they move in the same families? He said, because the law of karma, the law of making decisions, action and reaction is being enacted within that group and they must get birth again within the same group. So majority of these keep on moving in the same circle. If one child from a family were suddenly to escape from the family and go away, leave India and come to America, for example, then it is possible that that the next generation may also be split far and wide and people with whom that child had karma may have to be born in other countries or may be great travelers in the future to sort out and settle that karma with a lot of people around. So I had an opportunity after that to understand a lot more about the law of karma than I had understood. It also gave an indication how through karma we have evolved in terms of consciousness. What has karma to do with consciousness? Before I proceed to tell you what karma has to do with consciousness, I want to answer one more question that I had in my mind and I got the answer. And that was, if the human soul, consciousness, has come from a divine source, which apparently is not within the realm of the mind which makes free will decisions, how could that soul have any karma? And the answer was, the soul has no karma. Neither then nor now, nor in future. Our living force, our reality, our real self has no karma at all. Never had, never will. Therefore, the karma game is not a game of the soul. It is a game of the mind. The mind where it is added on to a soul and derives life from the soul and works in a body, then that mind operates the law of karma in that body using the soul only as a motive force to become alive. The soul is performing no other function in karma except to provide the motive living force, the vital force that makes the system go and makes it alive, aware and conscious. But the law of karma operates only at the mental level. Therefore, only when we take mental decisions does the law of karma operate. Not only that, it was found that there is no karma at the sensory level either. The senses cannot create a karma. Neither eyes, nor ears, nor listening, nor hearing, nor seeing, nor touching, nor tasting, nor smelling, they cannot create karma. Nor can the body create any karma. The physical body is incompetent either to create karma or to deal with the principles and laws of karma. Then where does karma come from? Karma comes from only the middle ingredient in this whole complex called the human mind. And that function of free will that is taking place, is taking place only in that middle ingredient called the mind. There is no free will in the cells of the body. They are all programmed, totally. There is no free will in the senses. And the soul does not need any free will. It's just life force. Then the only experience of so-called free will is taking place in this middle level new manager that has come in called the human mind that makes decisions, says, I can do this, I can do that, thinks about these things and creates karma. Therefore, karma is a mental activity. Karma is a mental law. Karma relates to what the mind does. It does not relate to any other sector. Therefore, when the souls came first in divine purity without any karma and picked up the mind, they picked up a mind of their choice which had a predetermined package of karma in the universal state. And when that mind 
embodied itself to become human on a planet, then that package was picked up. The initial package was the choice of that initial mind. And then it has gone on round and round till you can go back again. In meditation, in spiritual practice and evolution through a practitioner's way, one can even now become unaware of the body. There are means available now, thanks to the masters and great masters who walked upon this earth and told us the methods. They tell us there is a method available now and they are sharing it more openly now when we need it most than ever before, that that method can make us forget and become unconscious of the human body, unconscious of the sense perceptions, and only conscious of the mind and soul, and thereby see how karma was picked up. At that point, we can discard the whole pattern of karma for billions of years and pick up another one and start all over again. And that particular stage where karma is so stacked up that you can pick up has been referred to in the ancient Sanskrit text as the Akashic Records, sometimes in this country called the Akashic Records. It is referred to Akashic Records. Akash means the sky, the records in the sky. Because every time we become oblivious of one body that we have, we open up a new sky. This sky or this space, this dimension makes this earth, this cosmos real. When we withdraw our attention and become unconscious of the body, but remain conscious of ourselves, a new space opens up, a new dimension opens up, a new sky opens up. When we become unconscious of senses and open up another dimension, the third sky opens up. And it is in the top of the third sky that you can find that the records which make for the first package of karma are available. For shifting, you can shift to any karma you like. This is a great access to have that. But the great masters, the perfect living masters who come and teach us all this knowledge, they teach us that is not the end of the story. You can even go beyond that and leave the mind itself behind and still remain conscious. Then you will know who you are, what soul is, and that soul can survive by itself without these coverings of mind, senses, and body. And then you are free from karma altogether. You have a strange bliss and happiness of a kind unknown in this law of karma. So they make that door open. But even for those who do not want to go into that door, at least they give us so much knowledge and information of how it is all happening. And every scientific work that has been done and has come to my notice has constantly supported these statements that the mystics have made for thousands of years. So they tell us that this law of karma which operates, operates as a learning process. Why should the soul get tagged on, consciousness get tagged on to a decision-making mind? a mind that makes choices and then go on from body to body, incarnation to incarnation, for thousands of years, for hundreds of thousands of years, for millions of years, till the planet becomes cool or boils over and has to move to another planet. Why should this happen? Why should this game go on indefinitely from planet to planet? The game is going on for the process of learning and evolution. So evolution is correct. You see the evolution of the species. To the best of our knowledge, we have been able to see the evolution of the species. Similarly, there is evolution of consciousness. There is evolution of awareness. The awareness of that two-legged creature sitting in the midst of the dinosaurs and looking around was different from the evolution of the people only a few million years later. And the evolution will proceed further on a different planet in the same way. Now, when you look at the history of man in that way, you find that the tendency of the human being has been to evolve in two directions. The first direction is the physical, with which it identified itself when it got into the body. What did human beings use to evolve physically? They used the sensory perceptions and the mind. The mind and the sensory perceptions were used in order to evolve and develop physically, in material terms. Therefore, they looked for that which should physically benefit them. For example, the kind of nice clothes we can wear and show off and be happy about were not available to the guy sitting amongst the dinosaurs. He didn't have them. Nor were they available a few thousand years ago when we lived in the caves. Even in terms of these cycles of evolution operating 
as a learning ground, as a separate school for learning what we should do best for ourselves. You will find that there are in almost many, many countries, in several countries I know that they have dug up excavations and found out old civilizations. I have seen such civilizations in India, in excavation in Pakistan, near Taxila, and in India near Ropert. They have dug up civilizations and in the Indus Valley, the Harappa civilization and the Indus Valley civilization, they have dug up and found that a few thousand years ago, a couple of thousand years ago, we were barbaric living in the jungles. But three, four thousand years ago, we had homes with drainage, with many facilities, we had the streets with the street lights, and we find remnants of those things now. That means somehow. We rose to a better state of civilization, a better state of finding creature material comforts for ourselves and then dropped and lost that as if we lost suddenly. Because unless you lose suddenly, it does not happen that the whole thing can get submerged, capable of excavation again. So it looks that we had several periods like this. Not many people have uh, access to this kind of uh, work that has been done on excavations archaeologists and by anthropologists, but people are still working and finding clues to what were the kind of cycle. Some have said there is a 2000 year cycle, some 3000 year cycle, another society has found 5000 year cycle. Many speculators have given different cycles operating simultaneously, a 125,000 year cycle within which smaller 5000 year cycles operate and that the ultimate cycle of growth is 125,000 years. Some have said it must be quarter million years. Now the prediction is maybe it's 2 billion years, the life of the planet. The planet itself is one cycle of growth. But what kind of development is taking place amongst human beings as they grow on a planet? The development is in the skill of developing technology, developing methods, using environment for improving the creature comforts of the physical system. This is one direction in which human beings have gone. And today, we call that the scientific development. We use a general term for it. That the scientific development took advantage of the empirical conditions of what is happening around, which can be universally demonstrated outside in physical matter. And therefore, all branches of science, which began to branch off because of specialization required, they all concentrated on the physical well being of the human being. And today you can see we developed computers, we developed things, we don't need to work too much, we can let machines do a lot of work. I saw in Tokyo, the Japanese are great in this computer work, I saw in Tokyo their model of a future home. People are living, all the servants are doing the work. They don't do anything, they just have fun. The owners of the home have fun, the servants are cleaning the floors, they are cooking the food, serving it turning on the news at the right time for you to view. You don't even have to take the bother of pressing a remote button now. It's all programmed in advance. You can go at the right time and they turn on everything. And yet the only living beings in that house are the owners. All the rest are computers. They are all computer servants. All the computers are performing. They have not only said this is possible, they have demonstrated that they are actually working. You can go and see it in Tokyo. That they are actually working in a model home and they think in the next century the Americans will also copy them because the Americans have started copying the Japanese a lot in technology of this kind. So they feel that this kind of creature comfort will reach its acme. But then that makes it a little dangerous statement. Because when we look at the Mohenjo-daro, Sindh and the Harappa civilization and other old buried civilizations and find out what was the stage when they sunk themselves. That was the stage when they created the maximum comfort for themselves. When they became so contented with the physical comforts that they got bored with the physical comforts, they destroyed themselves. If that be so, then it is dangerous to look at this view that in the next century we are going to create conditions for ourselves which may be so comfortable that we may be tempted to let the devil of a mind run the violence and aggression against ourselves and destroy ourselves. These two things have been very contradictory. On the one side, the development of the human being as a peaceful person wanting to develop all the goodies of nature around himself, all the benefits of science and technology 
and on the other hand, the mind is developing this because the mind senses and the body are doing this. They developing along with that are getting into their wildest modes and destroying themselves. Why does the mind behave like this? If the mind can create such wonderful technology and create so much comfort and creature benefits for, uh, for itself and for the body, why should it destroy itself? You can't blame the mind for doing it. The mind is constructed in such a way. The mind is constructed to perform its function by splitting reality into a stretched out phenomenon called time space continuum. The very thing that was discovered by the scientists recently and who have highlighted this particular force of the time space continuum that this force is a very naughty mischievous force. Watch out. A thing that can be put into this force can be very self-destructive. Why? Because when a single element of reality is stretched to be made into a past, present and future, when a single timeless event has to be put into the form where it should have a beginning, a middle and an end, where a single immortal life has to be put into a form where it must have a birth, a life and a death, where we have to put every known experience to man in the mind, senses and body into this framework of beginning, middle and end, you are stretching it to a point where the only process available to the mind for doing this becomes breakup and analysis. Split is natural to the mind. You will notice the more you use your mind, the more you like to split things. Did you know that analysis is just a modern euphemism for splitting? And splitting creates aggression. What is the opposite? The opposite is synthesis, joining together, oneness, all the higher values we talk of, which the mind does not understand or even comprehend. Those higher values we have to ascribe to a separate part of our being, which we call soul, spirit, spiritual self, which is not subject to this law of analysis and breakup, which is performing functions like love, intuition, timelessness, rapture, peace, joy, bliss. That function is being performed by another part of our being that is not subject to these three, the mind, the senses and the body. Therefore, while the mind, senses and body was busy evolving into the best possible creature comforts, they were also evolving in splitting aggression, violence, hatred, killing each other at the same time. And you notice the history of man to the best that we know of, that these two developments have taken place together. The development of the creature comforts through science and technology and the development of violence and aggression and war at the same time taking place with the very highly sophisticated societies who built the maximum peace. If you feel that perhaps these two did not go together, you can look at different parts of the planet where the evolution of these two is in different stages. Go to the tribals. I have mentioned in this very place or just earlier that in the Indian Ocean there is a tribal island, tribal islands, where old aboriginals are living and have not been touched by this process, either of developing their technological creature comforts, they live in the jungles, they live naked, they don't wear clothes, they have no idea of televisions and homes and cars and automobiles, but they also don't kill each other, they love each other, they are also much better off that way, showing thereby that these two developments of the mind using senses and body are simultaneous. So long as the mind outwardly through the physical systems develops, it has to develop both these together. Then what is man left with? Man is left with consciousness and that develops differently. Consciousness develops in the opposite way. Consciousness develops towards peace, harmony, love, joy, bliss. Those features which are not mental, which do not require time to be split up, which do not require the illusions of karma and free will to exist. Therefore, the core of human beings, the consciousness of human being, the soul of human being also has a history along with this and operates simultaneously. While on the one hand, the human being in the course of history has developed these goodies for himself and also violence and war for himself, at the same time, the consciousness revolting against it has tried to escape from this and tried to find a way into real peace. And that is the spiritual quest of man. 
So the spiritual quest of man has also kept pace along with the destructive aspects of the human mind, senses and body. When you look at the spiritual quest of man, you find that unlike the mass production technique of science and technology and the massive system of numbers of the mind, the development of the human, evolution of human consciousness has been on a very selective basis. It does not believe in mass production because the mass production is already going on. So it picks up individuals from amongst this rat race going on, individuals who can be individually, selectively brought up to give the benefit of that evolution to society as a whole. And then again, it comes up again through an individual and builds up and throws light around. So as the darkness of the soul grows through the overuse of the mind and technology, the light pillars up from now once in a while. And these individuals that come up from now and again through the process of evolution, every time they come up, they shed their light and benefit a lot more than before. They give access to more knowledge of things that are beyond the mind than ever before because this evolution keeps on taking place also. So eventually, we find we come to a stage when we are at the verge of destroying ourselves. At that very time, we have human beings sitting who can save the whole of humankind. But this special faculty of consciousness to evolve to these limits that it can perform a savior's function from time to time, ultimately extending the scope of saving to almost the whole of humanity is a special feature of this evolution that is taking place. Look at our present position today and look back into the history as we know. And you will find when you take the glimpses of human evolution that we have fully uh, followed this particular chart that has been explained by the great master. That we have in fact grown biologically into bodies that correspond more and more with the requirements of a civilized creature comfort society. Our bodies will become in the future less muscular, more brainy, more use of computers and a different sort. It has been predicted and it is following exactly that pattern. From gorilla type of bodies, we will become very, very thin kind of uh, people who only need to think and program. That's all that we will need to do, program our machines and get the best out of this life. It is happening. You can see it every time. In spite of all the athletic clubs you may open, they are only to maintain health, not to go back, regress into a different type of body. You will also find that the foreheads of people, the foreheads of people from this slanting position are becoming like this, like this, and may become ultimately like this. Why? More space needed for the functioning of that part which will be most used. This physical structural change that is taking place. Have you ever seen people who have got a protuberant foreheads like this? If ever you come across, meet them, talk to them, they may be the replicas, they may be the prototypes of the people of the future. You may be able to have an idea what future people will think like, unless it's done by accident or something. But if you see the evolution going through this, and you will find people who have these kinds of sloping, sloping foreheads even now, and talk to them, and you feel maybe they're still in the gorilla age, they haven't moved too much, they don't have the missing link. You can find these distinctions in the functioning of the body and its shape even now. So the biological evolution of the body is going apace with the system of evolution. Similarly, the thoughts of the people. You forget their creature comforts and thoughts. And you will find thoughts of hatred, thoughts of competition, thoughts of trampling upon others are growing at the same time. Thoughts of disgust, thoughts of frustration, thoughts of not trusting anybody. Not th thoughts of not knowing who is to be trusted. Thoughts of not knowing there is a distinction between truth and untruth. These will be growing at the same time because of the evolution of the mind. At the same time, you will find thoughts of finding the creator, seeking the Lord, seeking the truth are also growing at the same time. How are these opposing things happening? These opposing things are happening in different directions. The creature comforts are entirely a physical material development. The mental things are entirely in the Akash, in the universal mind. It's an evolution taking place in a different pattern and is not confined to a physical body. When a person is born and thinks, he doesn't think 
with the experience of pain in their body. Little children. There was a little girl, I think seven years old. I met her in India. And she played like other children. Was, was a child actually, was seven years old. A child very sheltered, who had not been to any foreign country, had not even been to a big city, was living in a small town and lived all the time there. And suddenly she would sit and start giving a wonderful discourse on the nature of creation and quote from texts. And then she would suddenly drop off from there and go and start playing with the kids again. I heard that this, this was happening in Jaipur, in one of the small towns in India. So I went to that town and met the family. I knew a family friend. I said, what about the little girl? She talks like that. They said, sometimes she does. So her mama called her. Come on, there's a guest here. So I know I'm fed up of guests. I don't want. I want to play. She wouldn't come. She shouted just like any other children. But they persuaded her to come. She sat. She talked of pops and the other things and her own little ch childish toys and dolls and games. And suddenly she became serious and began to give a discourse which baffled me. And I, if I in retrospect think of what she said, some of you people think I give nice lectures. She would replace me easily in any of these lectures. She gave such a profound, good, accurate discourse on a subject of such philosophic dimension. I can never expect any child to be tutored like that at all. And once she was through with about 15 minutes of that great discourse, she just went back into the same mode of a child and ran away to play. Now, I have seen that happen more than once. But this was a classic case of such a small child who cannot be tutored. But this thing coming shows that when the human mind expresses itself, it does not express from the knowledge and history of this body. This has not grown into that mind from this body. It is following a different evolutionary pattern based upon its own experiences over and over again, which shows that we are not using a fresh mind every time we come into a human body. We use an old, stale mind which has been used over and over again in previous body. And therefore, we are collecting the impressions on that mind which come and affect us and bother us and mess us up over here. We don't want to hate somebody. We go on the very face, we say, this, I just don't like that person. Why? What has that person done? The person is good looking. The person is perfect in the body. There's no defect. Why do you say you don't like that person? I don't know why, but I feel so bad, disgusted. Well, this is not being, this statement is being made by the mind. It's the mind that thinks like this about that person. At that moment, the mind having been allowed to grow up in this body and being considered and allowed to be considered a function of this body and not an independent being coming to occupy a body, but a function of this body must relate everything to this body. And therefore, this identification with the body confuses it, cuts off all the previous memories and makes it feel, why should I hate this person but still hates? So the impressions on a mind and the evolution of a mind are quite independent from what is happening on this body. But what is happening on the soul is totally independent from these two. It is not based upon what the mind is doing, nor based upon what the body is doing. It is evolving into its awareness by itself, so that the seeking in our heart can come, not to the good people who are doing great charities and good work. It can come to robbers and gangsters. People wonder how it can happen. People used to ask the great master when a guy named Shadi came to him. Have you heard the story of Shadi? He was a gangster, a highway robber. And he decided to rob the headquarters of the great master in India because he found that his followers, the great master's followers, were building a nice big temple-like structure called a satsangar, the home for discourses. And there the great master was supposed to give discourses when it rains and it cannot sit out in the sun. Therefore, they made a beautiful home and on the little minarets, like other old temple structure, they were going to plate it with solid gold. And for that purpose, many of the followers of the great master had collected gold in their homes. And there were very few homes, about 20 or 30 homes in the whole of that colony called the Dera. And when that, when that gangster heard about it, he said, that should be simple game. And he came to prey upon the gold in that dera. And when he came, he heard, got all the information from his colleagues that there is a satsang or a 
this course that takes place in the evening at 5 o'clock. At that time, all the people go to listen to the master. They are all outside. Nobody is at home. That's the best time to go around. Because only where the gold is lying, they leave sometimes one person just to take care. So it's very simple. Wherever there are people sitting, that's where the gold is. So you can easily find out. So coming on a reconnaissance mission, this gangster and robber, he came and he looked around and he saw all the people had gone away to listen to the discourse of the great master. And he went and saw sometimes just a little child, sometimes one old woman sitting there. He said, haven't you gone to discourse? And they said, no, you know, we have to take care. It's our duty today. We take by rotation because of the gold, you know. They said, where is the gold? They said, oh, it's lying all there. He said, I wanted to give some. They said, you wait till the other people come, then you can donate your gold. So he found out exactly where the gold was, how easy it was to rob. It was one of the easiest trays he had found. So he decided to make a plan to bring two or three of his colleagues as gangsters, rob the place and run out. But suddenly, when he was about to leave, it occurred to him, what is wrong with these people that they should go and start listening to a man giving this course? So he decided just out of curiosity to walk into the gathering and see what is that old man saying. And as he walked, the old man was talking about the word which reverberates like a melody inside each human being. And the great master said, that is the key to reality. If you can listen to that word within, if you can listen to the celestial, heavenly melody music inside, you can go into the higher levels of consciousness. And that melody is not reverberating in any few people. It reverberates in all of you. Even in the gangsters, it reverberates. That was the time when the gangster was standing outside. When he heard the great master said, even in the gangsters and the robbers, that is reverberating. He said, this man has recognized me. How could he know I am here? This so much puzzled him that he went up to him after this course. He said, I came to rob your gold. But this statement you made, that there is a melody that can connect us with God. And that is not only amongst good people, even in the head of a gangster, it is resounding. This struck me. How did you know me? The great master said, I don't know you. Who are you? What do you do? He said, I rob people. He said, no, but if you want to come and get initiated from me and listen to me, you have to stop robbing. He said, I am willing to stop robbing. The great master said, then you have to earn your living. What will you do? He said, I know nothing else. All, all that I learned was how to rob people. That's the only occupation, profession I know. I've never done anything else. The great master said, that's very difficult. I can't uh, let you rob here and then say you're going to do meditation and find the inner melody. You must do something else. Didn't you learn something else for the sake of robbing? Didn't you learn any other art? He said, yes, I used to drive a truck once. And when they used to break down, I used to repair. I became a specialist in the dynamos and armatures and the electrical system in a truck. He said, fine, go and buy a few armatures and prepare some dynamos and some electric lights. We don't have any electric lights. So that gangster, Shabi, he began to repair those. But the intensity with which he was a robber, moving in a negative direction. The whole thing shifted almost overnight into a pursuit of truth. And he said, what foolish waste of energy I did that I put all my conscious energy in that direction. So he switched the whole of it into this direction. And he was the one who was able to not only get the melody, the light, but he was able to traverse into higher regions and get the joy of moving on Akashic records, past, present, future. He was able to talk to people who were the masters of the past, including Jesus Christ. He was one of those people who had a personal experience of doing that when he changed from robber to saint. And that man then remained as the personal bodyguard, a great master. He used to look at him and say, this gangster, how did he become such a great devotee? The great master explained, when you look at the evolution of the human spirit of human consciousness, it is following an independent line of seeking. When the seeking is strong, the only thing that is removing you from seeking the truth is your external experience through the mind which puts you into negativity. If you can pull that intensity of seeking back into the Lord, you work as fast there as you have worked into the scientific approach outside. Therefore, if a person is intense in anything in this world and withdraws and wants to be intense in spirituality, he makes the maximum, maximum gain. So you will see these strange developments 
I have shared some of these glimpses of the development of human beings from time to time, how the physical and material is taking one turn of evolution, the mind and the mental process is taking another evolutionary trend, and the spiritual evolution of consciousness is taking a third strand, and we are all the time a combination of these three. What makes us unique is this combination. What makes us unique is the middle strand of free will. What makes this free will useful and harmful is the same free will can make us go towards the devil and towards material gains and the same free will can switch and become the seeker and find the truth within ourselves. Thank you very much for sharing. Thank you.